develops inside the abdomen in the gonadal ridge which is in the paramesonephric area and uh, the descent of the testis is basically in two phases. The abdominal phase of the descent is controlled in a different pathway and the groin phase or inguinal phase is in a different pathway. So if we need to understand the pathophysiology of this, around 8 to 15 weeks which is the abdominal phase, there is two ligaments that hold the testis. The upper ligament from, the, from where the testis suspends from is called the cranial suspensory ligament and the lower one as we all know is the gubernaculum. So what happens is the testosterone that the testis secretes intra-abdominally causes the regression of the cranial suspensory ligament. So the cranial suspensory ligament slowly goes away and this is the leading cell insulin like structure, the hormone in this INSL3 with mullerian inhibiting substance, they cause the gubernacular enlargement. So this is pretty, you know, a mechanical thing. So what happens is the, with these hormones, the upper suspensory ligament becomes weak and disappears and the lower one enlarges, bringing the testis down from the abdomen up to the deep ring that is near the groin. The second half of the testicular descent that is from the groin into the scrotum occurs a little later, around 28 to 35 weeks. And here the mechanism is different. Here what the testosterone does is it stimulates something called a calcitonin gene related peptide. This CGRP, what it causes, it causes a stimulation of the this nerve which is called the genital branch of gendrofemoral nerve and that causes contraction of the gubernaculum enlargement and testicular descent and this neurohormonal pathway is important. So many a times when there is a failure of descent from the test or from the groin to the scrotum, there are some neurohormonal problems that are associated with it. So this is a very interesting picture which can easily you know tell and now when we look at the causes of undescended testes, it can be anything that when start off with you know the pituitary the testicular axis which has got hormonal problems, it can occur at the receptor receptor level malfunction where the testosterone receptors are insensitive so the testosterone can't work. It can occur due to neuronal problems as happens with you know, spina bifida cases where these nerves are not well developed or non-responsive or atrophic. So this the genitofemoral part of the nerve is not working. So these are the mechanisms. So this image is a very interesting image. So how do we diagnose? Usually immediately after birth, your pediatrician or neonatologist, neonatologist who is looking after the kid would immediately say that one of the testes is not or both testes is not present within the scrotum. So what do we do? It's a pediatric surgical referral and our call is we go and examine the child. Not only we try to palpate the testes, we try to figure it out whether it's in the groin or not, but also we look at the external genitalia whether the penis is properly formed or not because you know many syndromic cases where we have got some kind of androgen insensitivity there may be some grade of hypospadia associated with such kind of testes. We also look at the scrotum because you know many a times the testes had come down but after birth due to some reason due to cremasteric spasm, cremasteric pull the testes might go up. So if a testes had come down in the scrotum, the scrotum would look full. It would like you know it is a developed scrotum. But I'll show you images where scrotum doesn't look that developed. That means testes hadn't come down at all. So we diagnose it if in a setup, in a hospital setup, we diagnose it at birth. Many a times we receive this child late in our OPD, you know, maybe at one month, two months of age, when the parents are concerned, they have found out that, you know, there's one testis is missing and they come to us and say, sir, how do we go about it? So the best diagnostic tool for an undescended testis is by far meticulous examination by a pediatric surgeon or a pediatric urologist because that is probably the most sensitive examination. If we can palpate the testis in the groin area that is between the deep ring and the symphysis pubis and the root of the scrotum, if we can palpate the testis that's it. That means the testis has come down from the abdomen and now is it's in the groin. So usually by textbook teaching we may not need to do any more investigations on if it's on one side. And we just go about to t for the rest of the like for the surgery and everything. But in case we do not get the testes in the groin, we don't call it an undescended testes anymore. We simply term, term it as an impalpable testes because it may be in the abdomen, it may not be in the abdomen because testes inside the abdomen might undergo torsion and might have disappeared. So the moment we utter the word undescended testes, the load that comes with it is that the testis is there and it hadn't descended. But when we term it impalpable, the surgeon or anyone couldn't palpate it, couldn't find it. It's better to say it's an impalpable testis and 
then we take the diagnostics from there. Adjuncts to clinical diagnostics in this case is an ultrasound, which we usually do if it is in the groin, they can tell you that not only the size of the testes, the position of the testes, because many a times at six months, seven months, the child becomes a little chubby, a little fat. So there is a good amount of suprapubic fat. You might as well miss the palpating the testes. But in those cases, an ultrasound might detect a testes. One of the confounding variables in this case is a lymph node, which might as well look like the testes. So in addition to the ultrasound, we usually ask the radiologist to do a color Doppler to see whether the blood supply to the testes, because the blood supply of the testes is very unique. It's not like the lymph nodes blood supply. So you can understand. You can also comment about the echogenicity because if a testis remains too long within the groin or within the abdomen, the testis starts losing its normal structure. So the way it would look normally on an ultrasound would actually change. So echogenicity is a good marker that whether this testis will at all be functional or not. With addition to that, people in some textbooks, it has been mentioned that an MRI or a CT scan with an IV contrast would give you a better diagnostic. But overall, worldwide literature states that if a testis is in the groin, which we anyways can palpate, an MRI and CT scan can diagnose an UDT by around 90%. But if it is within the abdomen, the diagnostics go down as low as 50%. So we may choose to avoid it, but many a times we need to do an MRI in case we have bilateral testis and undescended testis. And so now comes optimum time of treatment. Histologically, it has been proved that by six months, if a testis doesn't descend by itself, within six months of age, six months of life, the testis starts to lose some of its structural stuff. Like, you know, leadic cells, the number of leadic cells come down, the spermatogenic function goes down. So it's advisable that we actually ideally should treat undescended testis surgically by around six to nine months of age. Maximum by 12 months, we should not delay the surgery by 12 months because of a testis that hadn't come down by 9 to 12 months will probably not come down and now the testis would definitely last losing its function. There is one school of thought which also states this fact that probably it's the inherent problem with the testis, structural problem because the leading cell INSL3 helps in the descent that probably the testis was malformed and that is the reason why it hadn't descended. But that's, you know, that's a different thought altogether. So anyways, the treatment remains the same. We have to bring the testes down and we have to put it in the scrotum. So what are the treatment options that are available to us? In case of a palpable testis that we call undescended testis, we can palpate it in the groin. We straightforward go ahead and do an open orchidopexy. It is a groin incision. We'll discuss the surgery later once we do go into the clinics. We'll open the groin, we'll mobilize the testis out will open the sac, tunica vaginalis sac, will dissect the vas and the vessels of the sac and ligate the sac at the deep ring. That's the herniotomy because many a times the, there is a clinical hernia which is associated with it. We'll mobilize the testis so much, we'll go retroperitoneally through the groin incision and we'll dissect a little so that the testis is mobilized beyond the pubic tubercle and then we create a subcutaneous tunnel up to the scrotum. We create a datos pouch, we place it in the datos pouch. So, we have discussed the terminologies also, like the undescended testes and the impalpable testes. So as I was telling you, with regards to impalpable testes, see, there are incidences where we may not be able to palpate the testes and on laparoscopy also, we don't see the testes. So the testes is not there, one side testes is not there. So this test testes probably had undergone an intrauterine torsion. Nothing can actually be done about it. Many times we call it a testicular nubbin, a small end of the testes is there. So many choose to you know, remove that nubbin and send it for biopsy to prove that, you know, it's basically a torsion testis that had actually disappeared. Similarly with vanishing testis, you know, the testis initially at birth was small, but probably it had undergone a torsion already and it is slowly in the phase of disappearing. So it will become atrophic and vanish eventually. And that is where the role of ultrasound with color Doppler comes in. Hand.